Welcome to Future Forum, where Australia's business and community leaders discuss the issues at the forefront of the economic agenda. I'm Professor James Evanatakis. Welcome to the show. In this program, we'll be discussing infrastructure, investment and the growth of Western Sydney. We'll be asking who should pay and how we can enhance economic and social opportunities in Sydney's West. But first, I'd like to welcome my co-host, Harold Mitchell AC, founder of the communications group Mitchell and & Partners and chairman of Aegis Media Pacific. Harold, welcome to Future Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also joining us on the panel tonight is 2013 Woman of the West, Alison McLaren, Member for Parramatta, Dr Jeff Lee, Western Sydney Regional Organisation of Council's President, Councillor Tona Hajidi. <laughs> Western Sydney is already an economic powerhouse, but what does it need to make business happen in the future? Is infrastructure just about construction or does the economy need better internet connection more than it does new roads? This is what Harold has to say on infrastructure and the digital age. In the west of Sydney, the most important thing that could ever happen is that it embraces the whole world, and the world embraces that too. It's one of the biggest infrastructure questions of the future is the broadband. Roads are really old fashioned, and I know that's a popular political approach to infrastructure, that we're building the roads of the 21st century, you would have heard that. We simply can't make the world work. If everybody wants to drive to work, it doesn't work. And what the digital world can do is it can bring the world right into your own home. And not only that, you can go out to the rest of the world. It can make you as modern as tomorrow, and it means that up to nine billion people eventually are available to you as a market. How good is that? And in the beginning, the taxpayer, the government, has to start the process off. Uh, as it was at the beginning of the last century with the roads, as it was with the airports and other things that couldn't be easily built uh, individually. Schools, hospitals, all were commenced by the taxpayer, but ultimately the people have to pay in whatever form it is, and we all have to understand that. They are the ones who get the benefit of that. The people will benefit from it. You can't say it's got to be the taxpayer that pays for it, because the taxpayer is simply the taxpayer's money, that is the people anyway. If we want to be competitive with this incredible changing world, we have to be the best in the world. We should be number one in the world. Now, there'd be an argument to say we can't afford it. My argument with this, we can't afford not to do it. But, you know, we're in the middle of the greatest century we could ever have, the Asian century. I could tell you stories of just how advanced Asia is in the digital world, and we have to catch up and keep up at all times. We should be number one. I've always said that knowledge is the most important thing you could ever have. Knowledge in Western Sydney is even more important. It's important for the people of Western Sydney, and if they do that, the people in Western Sydney will be ahead of everyone in Sydney, everyone in Australia, and even everyone in the world. What made Google work in just, uh, just 15 years? The boys that put Google together wanted to put every fact, everything that was ever known about everything, into Google, and they did. Knowledge is the most important thing that you can ever have. The smartest thing that Western Sydney could ever do is invest in education. Better than anything would happen with roads would be the building of the knowledge base of Western Sydney. And the digital world means that we can do that, and we must. Harold, you said that road infrastructure is becoming passe. Yes. Is the investment in road infrastructure time to leave it and just concentrate on the digital? Well, there'll always be a need for road infrastructure, fixing up potholes, doing things like that. But if we're talking about the future, the really big things that have to happen, building roads, the roads of the 21st century, is not a clever idea. That's the simplest part of it. The future is about the digital age. This is the biggest change of how people communicate with each other in every way since the printing press. It's very difficult because you have to represent what the people might want to think, but the clever thing about leaders is that they understand what the people should have and they convince the people they take them along with it. I understand the people on the panel, that they represent the people in every way like that. I represent the future, undoubtedly they do too. I built an advertising business that was into the future and it worked. Alison, biggest challenge of Western Sydney is moving people around, or one of the biggest challenges. I mean, how do you respond to, to Harold's need for the priority of digital infrastructure? 
Well, we have to recognise that though it's important that we invest in digital infrastructure, for people living in Western Sydney today, the challenge is getting from home to work and back again. And so we need to invest in the physical infrastructure that will facilitate those movements. That 75% of people in Western Sydney have access to the internet, 25% don't. That's half a million people who don't. So we need to invest in ensuring those people do have the, that access and we need to ensure that the educational opportunities are available in Western Sydney so that those high order jobs are available to people out here. But we need to ensure that the roads and public transport and other supporting infrastructure are in place so that the 70% of people who live and work in Western Sydney can move around freely. Um, Jeff, you represent the people of Parramatta. Now, what, what comes first, the sort of the investment into, into high-level digital jobs or is it the, the jobs themselves? Is it a bit of a chicken and egg scenario? Yes, Professor, clearly you have to do both of those at the same time. And, and Harold, I must take exception about what you said, that roads are passe, because the poor people of Western Sydney, I spent an hour and a half coming along the M4 this afternoon to be mm. here today. And I tell you, try and explain that, that we need fibre optic cables so that people can download their movies quicker, yeah. rather than actually fix up, fix up the road system so people can spend time. And in fact, the average person spends 185 hours a year in congestion. And How it's all about absolutely stupid. stupid. What are you doing about we, it? We have to create. We have to create centres of employment. We have to like well, Parramatta, how about, how about like Penrith. How about the home? Like Penrith. Like, you don't, you like don't have to travel at all then. Absolutely, absolutely. But the reality is, most jobs in Western Sydney are, are, tend to be lower skilled than those in the city. Even when you look at the divide between Parramatta and the city, <laughs> the high knowledge that. jobs. Yeah. So we have to do catalyst projects. Things like by the Westmead Biomedical Precinct, where we can Perfect. do research, we can do Great. training, yeah. and we can do clinical practice. Yeah. Well, let me say this, if I may. We're not going to go over time no, of this, right. are we? Please go. Just one more little, little answer, I'd have to say that. We need brave politicians, of which you're clearly one, and we have to jump over all of that. That's what I would say. Right now, we have, th we have people in Shanghai. I've known Jakarta, I had an instance there, where they can do all these things there, and they get them done. Roads are blocked, they do them from home. Bali, an incredible, incredible intellectual uh, centre of the, of the digital age and things like that. I say about all of our politicians, we have to take a great big jump. At the same time, the roads, I understand all of that. I would never be a politician because I'd never be elected. I've got too many crazy ideas, but they work. I'd, I'd, I'd vote for you, Harold. Except we don't, we don't acknowledge that in Western Sydney a huge base is manufacturing, which cannot be done from the home. So 80,000 people in Western Sydney need to move. The other huge industry is transport and logistics, the people who move our food around. Those people are always going to need to be on the road because you can't package your groceries from someone's home. You've got a road person here, I can see. <laughs> yeah, okay. let's, let's, let me go first to Tony and Good then back, to, well back to Jeff. Um, the, I suppose the question is, if we do invest heavily, I mean, if we do need to invest heavily in both the, the physical infrastructure of roads and so on and digital infrastructure, the challenge is who, who should pay? Well, the, the, the users should pay. We, we got to get out of the mentality of thinking that government should pay for everything. There's only so much that the government can fund. Yes, it's very important that the government lead the way. It's very important that government has the right policy in place, uh, no matter what it is that we're doing. It's very important that government doesn't sit in an aeroplane on the back of an envelope and plan something out and then say, hello, deliver this. Mm. Government needs to lead the way when it comes to these big infrastructure projects. But at the end of the day, it's the user that ultimately has to pay for it. We do get the benefit. Jeff? Uh, technically, Tony is correct. We should have a user pay system, except, though, I think there's a role for government to design the infrastructure so it's installed properly. And there are some groups that will never be afforded, like rural and remote people, that clearly, in terms of social equity, economic equity, the government needs to step in, amortise those costs, perhaps, against those that can pay. I think, in our system. But the user pay system, I'd advocate for a system just like Sydney Water, for instance. They put in the, the main pipes down the street and then the user takes it mm. from the boundary into the home if they yeah. choose to. Makes sense. OK. Now, one of the, that's a social equity issue as well. Alison, do you think we've got into the situation where people... The user pay mentality means that we're not willing to cross-subsidise? And how do we change that kind of... that kind of a cultural belief, I suppose? I absolutely think that you should have 
taxation to pay for essential infrastructure. You'd increase taxes. I would increase taxes but to pay would, for infrastructure would you, would you and services. Taxes? No, I'd spend the money more wisely and get, get better value for the money that we so spend. I absolutely don't think that there is any fat left to be trimmed. And no, that rubbish. What oh, it comes oh, down to... Oh, there's all this fat to that. No, no, never. And, and that what happens <laughs> is that when you start making cuts, it's the most vulnerable that suffer because they are the ones who don't have a voice. So what we do is we cut welfare payments, we cut Couldn't access to services, we cut all of those things so that the people who are in Western Sydney are the ones who don't have a degree, who don't have access to education, who don't have access to health services, they're the people that suffer. They're the ones who would benefit most from your digital economy, but we need to give them the basics first. Okay, Better we education. Might to, we might have to leave it at that, actually. Oh, it's going so well. I know, but when we come back to it, we'll continue. <laughs> okay. So, when we do come back, we'll be talking about the danger of being left behind in the digital age. Welcome back to Future Forum. Jeff, let me ask you, what is the risk of being left behind in the age of digital infrastructure and how can we do, do it better? I think the most important thing is education, number one, is to equip young people with, and, and older people to that they're going to need to be reskilled every five to seven years to keep changing their careers. The digital infrastructure is simply a conduit in which they can react to their community, they communicate to the whole world, they can educate, self-educate. So it's really a communication medium and I don't think we should get stuck, uh, stuck in to the uh, level of detail in terms of just the uh, conduit, but it's really a method to communicate with other people and other communities. Harold, in your time across um, mm. Asia, um, how do we compare to the rest of um, to the rest of the world? Unbelievably badly. Okay. It's as simple as that. You could get a better interconnection in Africa than you can in Australia. How about it? I was just thinking before about, about what you said about Westmead the Hospital. You know, it is brilliant, incredible. If it's number one in the world, what the digital infrastructure. They're just words. What can it do? You know, you could have people in Darwin, in, in Beijing, could link into it uh, through all of that, and we can be the world. That's, that's really the point of it. I, I think you're exactly right. E-health is the future of the health system. Isn't it? Yeah. A third of our budget in the state gets spent on health. Can you yeah. imagine having consultations by video? Your records are transmitted, exactly. your imaging, your yeah. scanning. Yeah. You don't actually... Your bill payments. You actually don't have to turn up at, physically at the hospital unless you need to do it. And you've got a, you've got a program to spend a lot of money there, which, which is outstanding. I support that. Uh, I think we'd all say just, just one thing about it, be the best in the world, because you can go just anywhere. But let me, let me change tact on that. Alison, let's begin with you. Hospitals, these points of contact are often the glue of a community. What happens, I mean, is there an unintended consequence if we do sort of replace those types of connections with digital infrastructure? I think digital infrastructure does have a really important role to play in the health space, but there is always going to be that need for the consultation that there's going to be patients who are going to need to be seen by a health professional. At the moment, I'd probably settle for getting mobile phone reception at home. That yeah. It's ridiculous. I live in Winmalee, which was very heavily affected by bushfires last year. I didn't get the warnings until 25 minutes afterwards because my mobile phone didn't have reception. And that's quite standard. So. I think that we do need to move forward in investing in that That's kind terrible. of infrastructure. Terrible. Yeah, it, it is. I need to go to a shopping centre somewhere and it'll work there, surely. Uh, not in Westfield's Parramatta today, it didn't. No. <laughs> so this is, this is what terrible. every day that we, our... And, we use phones for communication and maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. We're, we're one but... of the richest nations in the world. Yet I get better, better mobile phone reception in Vietnam and Morocco than I do in Winmalee or Parramatta. That's bad. I mean, is this a consequence of the lack of competition or is there, again, if we go back to the need for government to really, to really push, push the barrow? I mean, Tony? I mean, is it too much competition we talk about overseas? Um, I recently visited Lebanon. There's only two people or two companies that provide um, internet and, and mobile phones. And no matter where it went, where you went over there, you could get internet and you can get yeah. mobile phone. Um, maybe government needs to come in and say it needs to be at a certain standard, otherwise you cannot operate. Um, there, there's no point having great competition, which is good, uh, it brings the cost down, mm. uh, but if you're paying low cost and receiving a low service, I mean, what's the point? It's, you're better off not having it. 
Jeff, let's go um, back to you. One of the things we've been talking about on the show is, is the changing nature of, of the workforce. I mean, we are seeing a, a massive economic restructuring and some of the traditional industries, be it manufacturing and, and so on, are, I suppose, under threat. I mean, is, are the, the Greenfield investments though, in, in places like Oran Park and, and so on, is, is that the future? I think uh, for, for Sydney, it'll be part of our future, maybe 30, maybe 50% of our new developments. We need in Western Sydney to house another 400,000 houses over the next mm. 20 years. So places like Oran Park, North West, South West, growth corridors will be especially important. That's the opportunity to put the fibre down the road, the fibre from the front door to, mm. the, to the street. They're the opportunities to build it then when it's cheap, when it's cost effective. It's the retrofitting of the brownfield sites, the infield sites, which are the very expensive. So I think as a matter of policy, that if we look at these sites and map these sites out properly, so when you're building 10, 20,000 homes at a time, you can actually put in the fibre optics that's required for the digital. I suppose the, the, the challenge of Sydney continues to be that we're still a hub and spoke city, you know, with every, every all the roads leading to downtown Sydney CBD. I mean, how can we resolve that? What is the opportunity to sort of have a, a, a more across, a you know, across cent, across city connections? I mean, both. I mean, we can do that digitally, but how do we do that physically? And, and is it, well, it should it be a priority? I'd say this: Why bother? Yeah. Why bother if it's going to be that hard to get from there to there and cost so much money? That's totally wrong. There's going to be another tell million tell more why. people in Western Sydney. Good. We don't want to turn it into the LA sprawl where houses go out from everywhere. We want to be able to concentrate on the polycentric nature of cities. Parramatta, Penrith, Liverpool should be strengthened. They're going to be the employment hubs. We want to be able to generate jobs within 30 minutes of where people live. And, and I suppose so we completely. don't sit there on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the point is if they have to travel across Sydney is what you're saying. Why would you, why would you bother doing but that? Why, why don't you do it all here? People don't travel to the CBD yet. Our, that is how our system is set up. So 70% of the people who live in Greater Western Sydney work in Greater Western Sydney. Should Only be 100%. Only 100%. 30% leave. Why, why, would, why would you bother? Why would you build all these roads to do that? Why can't you be a great centre out here? They have to come out here. And absolutely they should be. And this is why we need to be investing in infrastructure and in education. Because at the moment, companies don't want to headquarter out in Western Sydney because they don't feel they have the workforce but here. But you've got great education out here. We have a fabulous university, but we still only have 16.5% well, we of the population the with yeah. a degree. Can we I do. say we need the jobs first? So yeah. the jobs require catalyst projects. If it's Badgerys Creek Airport, it could be Westmead Hospital, but yeah, other catalysts, and they estimate, yeah. Professor Phil O'Neill estimates that we need one catalyst project the size of Barangaroo every year in Western Sydney just to keep up with the yeah. demand for employment. And, yeah. and you can blame, you can blame government on the issues of Western Sydney. It's been, and it was for a long time, used as a, as, as a political football. I'm not saying your government, and I'll get to, I'll, I'll give you a bit of credit in a second. Yeah. For, for a long time, but not West, too much credit. Western please. Sydney, not too much credit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Western Sydney, uh, for a long time, was seen as the place out there uh, where mm. the politicians would visit when an election come up and say, "Hello, I'm your best friend. Um, vote for me, and vote for me," and then all of a sudden go back into Macquarie Street. Um, or into to Canberra. Of late, we've seen, yes, the focus on Western Sydney come that time, but credit to your government now, Jeff, we've seen the follow through um, with the infrastructure projects and the belief in Western Sydney. We, we're seeing an airport finally get announced in Western Sydney. We're seeing roads and rail being delivered in Western yeah, yeah, Sydney. Do it. For a long time, it has been used as that football. Uh, finally, we, we are starting to get there, and, and hopefully next time you do one of these things, um, Western Sydney will actually be there. Still a lot of work. Yeah. But let me, cut, let me tell you, there's a story about Asia and what happens in Asia. Macau, I'm on the board of mm. Crown, uh, based in Melbourne, an entertainment facility, all the things that it might be. You might be able to argue about, uh, about, about gambling, but it, the things that it does. Crown has an interest in, in a casino in Macau. What was Macau? As we all know, it was uh, half a million people, a little Portuguese place with cobblestone uh, streets ten years ago. It is now, because they decided to do it, it is now six times bigger than Las Vegas. It is an economy uh, about uh, one-fifth the size of Australia. It is just those people there, that did, they decide to do it. The Chinese people that come across, ferry, helicopters, whatever, couldn't get them quick enough. They have built within three years from deciding to do it to finish up doing it, a road worth $13.5 billion, billion dollars in three years. That's about the cost of what our, our broadband might be. 
if, if, uh, if Minister Turnbull brings it down, it was going to be too expensive. We've been 10 years there, and we're still buggering it up. And that is really stupid. That's the pace of what's happening out in the rest of the world. So I agree with all of the sentiments of what you've got. Jobs are important. Uh, the great consideration that you've got in every way like that. The social fabric of what you want to do there. But we have got to get hurry. We have got to get on with those. I was at a conference the other day with some Indonesian people. Very senior minister in the former cabinet said uh, about uh, relations between us and Asia. The train has left the station. And I thought, that's the story here. Yeah, we might have to just leave it there and we'll, we'll be back and talk more in a moment. So after the break, we'll be hearing from Urban Growth New South Wales and a developer's perspective on digital infrastructure and the future of the West. Welcome back. John Brogdon is Chair of Urban Growth New South Wales and Ralph Bruce as consultant developer involved in the planning of Oran Park are both interested in the future of Western Sydney. Let's see what they both had to say. The tragedy of Sydney is we're catching up with infrastructure before we probably start laying significant new infrastructure. I think part of the problem is we have an almost colonial view sometimes to infrastructure, which is everything starts out a circular key and heads out like a spider's web. The reality is that many people will live, work, recreate and educate themselves in their part of Sydney. The issue of how infrastructure will change, I think, is also linked to how people's working patterns will change. I think infrastructure will change, and it will be a greater focus on digital infrastructure. It's almost impossible to imagine a city the size of Sydney can have enough infrastructure to move everybody around every minute of the day, every time they need it. So you are going to need to provide the infrastructure the capacity, the plumbing for people to work from home. If somebody who's doing, say, a data processing job can do that online, at home, and they cut up to 20 hours a week, potentially, of sitting on trains and traffic, another 20 hours of productivity, two pays is a business case issue. To some extent, there is a role for governments to play in nation-building infrastructure. As to who should own it, I don't think it has to be in public ownership. As to who should build it, sometimes there are some projects that will only get built if the government does it all or does some of it. And that, that applies with roads and it will also apply with uh, technology. The corridor from, say, Menangle Park through Camden, Norellan, Oran Park, up through Badgerys Creek Airport, St Mary's and then on to the northwest sector, that is the growth crescent of Sydney. Well, Oran Park's one of the precincts within the Southwest Growth Centre, which was originally identified back in December 2001. Oran Park is unique in that uh, it's that single family ownership and they have a very long term vision to develop a, a legacy development for Western Sydney government had in mind creating 21st century living environments and having Landcom on board as the project development partner has also assisted a hell of a lot in that regard because Landcom have been very visionary developers and, and right at the forefront of sustainability and, uh, and creating communities. Being part of a 21st century new town we decided day one that we wanted to have the best and uh, latest technologies. Oran Park residents or in every premise gets fibre optics right to the premise. The Opticom system is capable at the moment of 100 megabits per second delivery and be readily expanded to one gigabyte. The first stage of the commercial buildings is uh, to open next month and included in that is a smart work hub. Smart work hub is an advancement on a serviced office. It allows people to come and rent a desk space for the hour, the day or a longer time period. Only large developers can think this, this broadly. It's obviously Oran Park's a very long-term project. There's a real role for government to coordinate the provision of bulk infrastructure. The reality is if you're putting infrastructure in ahead of housing, schools, etc., in order to encourage them to go there, if you build the rail line and then put the houses afterwards, then almost certainly the government's going to have to stump up with that. Tony, if you had to pinpoint one project that Western Sydney had to do to get ahead of the pack in the next 50 years, what would it be? I mean, it's hard to put it down to, to one, but if I had to choose one, I think the, the airport is the obvious answer. The, a Western Sydney International Airport opens up Western Sydney to the world. Yeah. It puts Western Sydney Good. on the map. 
and what it does also for, for the local businesses, for the manufacturing industries, mm. for everybody else that, that makes their dollar in Western Sydney, it gives them now a new market and that market is the rest of the world. Um, currently they need to transport their goods and then there's a cost to, uh, of transport as we know. They need to transport their goods. How are they going to get it across, uh, across the ocean into, a, into another country? Mm. Open up the airport. Um, ensure that our manufacturers use that airport, sell their services overseas. At Parramatta, we're very happy for Liverpool to become the uh, transport and logistics manufacturing hub for Western Sydney. At Parramatta, though, we want to be the, uh, the uh, finance, banking and education centre and biomedical centre. So yeah, I think yeah. what we've got to do in Western Sydney is create different precincts, whether it's logistics, Absolutely. freight, forwarding, gateway to, mm -hmm. the, to International Gateway or Parramatta to financial banking services, education, biomedical. I think we need to use the principles of agglomeration and find out what we do well and do that, as you say, Harold, be number one in the world. We absolutely need to diversify our economy in Western Sydney. Western Sydney was hit very hard by the GFC because we were so heavily invested in manufacturing and that was an industry that went very far backwards during that time. So I agree with both of you, but I do think that the airport is the once-in-a-generation opportunity yeah. and we have to get it right. And we have to get it right in so many different ways. We need to make sure that the airport caters for both freight, international and domestic traffic movements. I, I think that's fantastic and, and, and a credit to all of you, I have to say, because you, you live here and, and I don't, but, but I, I've, I've been into the world, I've beaten the world, I understand the world and, and I think the biggest thing that can happen is, is that you go out to the world. You don't have to cross over in a road or anything like that anyway and, and, and we've seen it happen in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, uh, that's what it was uh, and forget the roads, it doesn't matter. I was just thinking before about, about Cambridge University, one of the great intellectual places in the world. It's only got these tiny little lanes. You know what they all, they all do? They ride a bike. And, and forget the roads, just think, what is it that's going to make it great into the world? I understand what you say about, about uh, medical science, uh, and that can be the greatest thing. Someone, I, I know someone who flies uh, their mum with Alzheimer's, sadly lives in Jakarta, all the way to John Hopkins in America. They could well fly to your airport here from Jakarta, six hours here, and, and to your university. And that's where the world is going to be. The other thing I'd say is, is, is this. It's about leadership. That's the biggest thing in the world. Which mountain are we trying to climb out, out here in the West? It is to be number one in the, in the world that you're talking about. I understand the, 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 the multi-structure, what you have to have about that. Uh, and, but then just go for it. Fight for it. Uh, and, and make sure that the, the political will is there, which I understand right, that it is. I think you're right. And I think as a politician, we have to... We're always concerned, but we have to have visionary politicians yes, to actually yes. stand up, and I think the people will follow. And this needs to be more than just an airport. That there needs yeah, to be exactly. the opportunities that come from it. So the airport itself generates a thousand full-time jo jobs for every million passenger movements. Yeah. So there is a lot of job potential within the airport itself, but it's what you do around it. And we could create those technology hubs at the airport, around the airport, that would facilitate Western Sydney's growth in those industries. Yeah, and we should just find the ways to do it, I, I'd have to say. I mean, your government has been fantastic at pushing it. The, the thing I was going to mention, if we go back to leadership, we, we've seen a, a, a sort of a change in the structure of the, the, sort of the voting patterns in Western Sydney. And, I mean, Jeff, do you think that's... that is one of the reasons why politicians are paying so much more attention? I mean, it's no longer a taken-for-granted area, is it? I think it's, it provides such a large number of seats, whether at the federal or the state level, they realise that elections are won or lost in Western Sydney mm. and they can, they can determine actually elections. And I think, to be honest, that's why people pay attention to Western Sydney. It's because it is the third largest economy. It is a big export owner. It is a big manufacturing base. It will be the growth of the future for Sydney. You can't afford to ignore Western Sydney anymore. There's 17 state seats wholly encompassed within Western Sydney and 23 in total that touch on parts of Western Sydney. Mm. So that's out of 93 seats in Parliament, that is a huge number in this area. But more importantly than that, that it's generating billions of dollars a year into the Australian economy. The flip side of that is that if we don't look <coughs> after people and provide jobs, we have a higher unemployment rate in Western Sydney that you then have to invest in the infrastructure, the social infrastructure, to support people and that's not a good outcome for and I, th I think you're so right and the political uh, question is really very easy. Bill Clinton said it. It's the economy, stupid. And, and in the end, that's what drives people. They want to know that they're, they're doing well, they want to do things well for their kids and, and everything like that. Perhaps we've just been a bit too laid back. And I think 
if something came out of it tonight, it'd be they were just going to push on with this, Absolutely. push on with it in every way. One thing is about people in Western Sydney, they're aspirational. They want their kids to do Work it. Work harder. Better. Want to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we might have to leave it at that. Oh. So, that wraps up our conversation about digital infrastructure and the future of Western Sydney. I'd like to thank my co-host, Harold Mitchell. <laughs> and my guests, Alison, Jeff and Tony. I'm Professor James Ivanitakis. Thank you for joining us.